Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, yeah. That was um, uh, a great talk. I can't imagine a better way to, to open the event and to set the tone for the event. That's uh, set the bar very high. So uh, uh, I wish the best to all the other speakers. Uh, <laughs> uh, our next speaker, Steve Watson, is a friend and colleague from London. And it's uh, a pleasure to introduce him because I know he will more than be able to match the, the, the uh, Yaps talk. Um, Steve st runs uh, Stat Magazines, which, in case you don't know it, is, uh, uh, he he'll tell you more about it, but it's, it's a subscription service where you, can you, you, you pay a, a, a subscription and you receive a different independent magazine every month. It's a brilliant idea. It builds on everything that's happening in the independent scene at the moment. Uh, he's going to give us a little overview uh, of the independent scene, give, him some, give us some thoughts on that, and then talk in a little bit more detail about Stat Magazine. So a big welcome for Steve Watson. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much uh, to everyone for, well, to, to Jeremy, Horst, um, and, and everybody for inviting me to, to come here today. Um, I've got to say up front that um, I'm not as cool as Yap. Um, I was asked once to do this, and I said yes straight away, because I was so excited about coming here. Um, <laughs> also, I have to say, just so there's no disappointment halfway through, there are no penises in glasses in, in this presentation. So, I'm sorry, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Maybe we can get Yap back on, he can do some more penises for us. Um, okay, so... Uh, my name is Stephen Watson, um, and uh, I run Stack. Um, and I always like to start these things with a, a show of hands. How many people here knows what Stack is? Aside from what Jeremy just said. Okay, good, excellent. Lots of people to educate. <laughs> okay, so Stack is this. Um, Stack is a service that sends out uh, a different independent magazine every month. You never know what you're going to get next, but you do know that it's going to be a beautiful, intelligent, independent magazine that you probably wouldn't have seen before. Um, and this is just a, a, it's a crazy time to be doing this, because Stack started actually seven years ago, uh, and it was kind of a hobby to start with. Um, but Stack has really grown kind of on this rising tide of fantastic independent magazines. I mean, literally... Like, day by day, I get new magazines coming through my door that I've never seen before. And it's just such a fantastically exciting time to be, to be working with them. Obviously, when you get lots of something, that means that you get lots of bad stuff. So the, you need to kind of filter the bad stuff out. But actually, there's, there are these fantastic quality magazines that are in there. So I'm sure lots of you will recognize um, iMagazine. Up there at the top, a design magazine. Uh, then we've got Dumbo Feather, a uh, magazine from Australia, which we sent out last month. Uh, we've got Rap Magazine, which is all about illustration. That's made in Oxford. Uh, Little White Lies, a movie magazine. So really the idea is that kind of, it's this sort of excitement that you get with magazines. And that's something that magazines are just naturally good at. The, you know, people talk about kind of the serendipity of magazines and how you, know, kind of you, you turn the page and you never know what's coming next. And so Stack kind of like kicks that up a gear by saying, OK, you don't know what's going to be on the turn of the page, but you also don't know what's going to arrive um, through your letterbox. Um, so today I'm going to make um, an argument that um, this is new media. Um, what do I mean by that? I, I don't mean that these magazines are all starting to produce on CD-ROMs. Um, <laughs> that used to be new media once. Um, I want to argue that these magazines are fundamentally different to what came before them. In the way that they're funded, in the way that they're made... Uh, in the sort of scale that they work at, and really the, the, the kind of the motivations for making them are so different to what's come before that they need to be recognised as a different thing. And the trouble is that they look so similar to what's come before that you just kind of go, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's a magazine, get it, I've seen that before. But there, there are real serious differences. So I'm going to run through some of the magazines, uh, or really just a few magazines, um, to kind of uh, explain why I think that. Mm. And importantly, this little subtitle here, Reaching the 21st Century Magazine Reader, I think this is because the real problem for these magazines comes when they try to get out to their audience. So way back when I first started Stack, I, had this, I, you know, I sort of thought, 
I was writing for a lot of these magazines and knew lots of people who would love these magazines. So, you know, I was writing for Little White Lies. My friends who love film, oh, you, you would love Little White Lies. They'd never heard of it. And I kind of, at first I assumed it was to do because, well, they don't have budgets for marketing themselves. But actually, when I started speaking to publishers more seriously, I realized that it's distribution that is the real difficult problem for them. Um, and so that, you know, that's something that Stack tries to um, help with. Um, and I think that we need more of, of that kind of thing. But first, a little context. <laughs> I put this slide in here, and then I came for the technical check today and realized I was going to put a photo of my old living room like that big <laughs> on the wall. That's weird for me to see. This is Stack in the old days. This is how Stack used to uh, happen. I basically... Um, I knew a lot of the publishers anyway because I wrote, I, I wrote for them. And literally, they would send their cardboard boxes of magazines to me. I would um, print out letters. You can just see a letter in the top right there, kind of explaining to people why I chose that month's magazine. I'd print out the address labels, pack it all up. And at, I mean, to begin with, I'd take it down to the post office, and the post office hated me because the <laughs> post offices are not meant to be dealing with stuff like this. But then kind of... Bit by bit, as time went by, I kind of got more professional with it, realized that you, know, you can like, print your own postage and you can pay £12.50 and the post office will come to you. So the, the postman comes to the door and then kind of realized after that that you, know, kind of you could use a mailing house. And then you know, that my, my flat used to, for like two weeks of the month, would just stink of magazines. And you know, you get people doing that thing of like, they open a magazine and they go, ah. It's a beautiful thing. But when you can't smell anything else in your house for like two weeks, it's not a beautiful thing. You wake up with headaches. So, the, so, so basically, Stack kind of evolved. And like, you know, these days, there's a mailing house up in the Midlands. And kind of, you know, it's, all, it's all much more professional than it, than it used to be. But it still was something that you know, I'd started it on one day a week, and then two days a week, and then three days a week. Um, and I finally, last year, took the leap and said, OK, I'm going to do this. I need to do it properly. Um, and go full-time and professionalize. And so as part of that, we had a relaunch of the site and a redesign. Um, and I really kind of like spent a lot of time um, working with very clever uh, web people, um, figuring out why should someone subscribe to Stack. Because when someone comes to a website, you've got such a small amount of time to tell them what you do and persuade them it's a good idea. So when you go to the Stack uh, subscribe page, this, these graphics kind of run in a line down. The, the, the page is sort of my like, persuader page. So the, you start at the top and you get these things, and then you go down a bit further and you get some nice things people have said on Twitter. And then you go down a bit further and you get some nice things that Jeremy said. And the, so it's all kind of like you know, pushing people towards subscribing. But so, I mean, the, within this, there are some pretty uh, obvious ones. So read more, obviously. If you subscribe to Stack, you're going to get a magazine every month. You'll read more. Uh, improve your mail, again, obviously. So, you know, kind of people don't like getting bills all the time. So Stack is something that plops through your door and, you know, you've got something nice and fun to read. Save money is obviously a big one. Um, so, I mean, basically the way that um, I work with Stack, um, I work about six months ahead of time. And so that means that I can uh, speak to the publishers and say to them, OK, so in August, um, I'm going to want approximately 3,500 copies of the magazine. Now, for a lot of these publishers, they might only be printing two or 3,000. So for that one run, they're doubling the, the run that's going out. So by treating that extra stack amount as a run-on, because it's guaranteed, there's no sale or return or anything like that, they're able to bring the unit cost of that run-on right down I mean, literally to pence in a, lot of time, in a lot of cases. So basically, that means that I'm able to get the magazines way cheaper than anyone else can get them, and I'm able to pass that on to Stack subscribers. So, I mean, for you know, most of these magazines in the UK are kind of around the £10 mark. Uh, in the UK, it's um, £5.50, so almost half price. Um, in Europe, I can't remember off the top of my head what the um, monthly price is, but... It's a good deal. Um, stay inspired. You get lots of uh, kind of creative agencies and universities and places like that uh, using Stack because it's a good way to see new stuff. But it's this one at the end that really has resonated with people, and it's completely by accident. So I, I've picked on Amazon for defeat the Amazon algorithm, and, and that's because 
I mean, literally years ago, um, I bought my little sister uh, Sylvanian family's um, set, and I still get emails from Amazon to tell me that the Badger family have got a new car. I don't care. It's not me. I don't, I don't, I'm not into Sylvanian families, but Amazon tries to guess at the sort of things that he thinks I like. Google do the same thing. So whenever you do a Google search, Google will guess at the sort of things that it thinks that you like. I do the same thing to myself in social media. So if you looked at my Instagram account, you'd think that everybody in the world is making independent magazines because that's what I'm into. So we have this, this illusion that because we live in the age of the web, in this digital time, our horizons have never been broader, when actually we narrow our horizons the whole time. So we're, we're seeing less and less and less things. Stack completely blows that open. You know, the people often say to me, well, you know, kind of, can I sub subscribe to a type of stack for sports and going out and something else? No, Stack does not care what you're interested in. I care about sending out the best, just the best magazines, because that's the way that you can guarantee that even if I send out a cycling magazine and you read it like cycling, you will find something in that magazine that resonates with you. There will be something in the care taken over it, the beauty, the attention to detail. Um, at the same time, I also uh, realized that I spend my entire life doing stuff like this, uh, coming and trying to persuade people that they should subscribe to Stack. And then when they subscribe to Stack, they got this nasty little letter from the subs agency that I use, just kind of saying, you have subscribed. Uh, your number is 37892. Uh, so we kind of kicked all that out. And so now there's, when people subscribe, you get like a nice... Uh, welcome letter on proper letter-headed paper. It comes in a little branded envelope. You get a little welcome card um, that comes with it. Uh, you get some stickers because Apple do that. And so if, you know, if Apple send you stickers, that must be right. So the, it's all just kind of about trying to make people think that this is more than just getting magazines. This is you joining a club. This is you kind of signing up for something that's going to make a, a tangible difference to your life. That's, that's what I'm kind of trying to get across to people. And finally, we do stuff like this. So um, I noticed that, uh, actually, interested to see apps and very similar pictures like this. Um, I noticed that when people's magazines arrive every month, uh, it kind of like flares up on uh, Instagram and Twitter with people taking pictures of their magazines and like they're you know, saying, ah, oh, I'm so excited. So I started to encourage it. And so now every month, um, and depending on how late the party goes on tonight, I'll be doing this for the blog tomorrow. It might be a bit late. Um, so basically, the, every month I select my favorite five um, pictures from the month and publish them, and the winner gets a stack t shirt. And it's just completely blown up. And so the, the winner for this one was the, this one over here. This woman had, so, so Sidetracked is the magazine I sent out last month, um, and it's an adventure magazine. And she, in her little caption, she'd said that she'd baked um, uh, black pudding sausage rolls and trekked off to a forest clearing to have her lunch with Sidetracked. And it's like, what? <laughs> you did what? Or the, I mean, like, okay, this guy down here sort of like tweeted saying, thank God Stack's here in time to help me through the hangover. And then this one up here was saying, um, oh, good, sidetracked. I've just been out for a 10-mile run, and now I'm drinking my smoothie, and I'm going to read sidetracks. It's like the people with such different lives that, that this is kind of fitting into. And I find that so exciting. I absolutely love it. So, the, so this is something that, you know, kind of, it's exciting for me, but obviously it's helping to kind of like promote the service. And, and promote the excitement of it. And again, make people feel that they belong to something. Um, so the point of showing you all those things um, is to then show you this thing. Um, this graph is rare uh, for two reasons. Uh, firstly, it's very rare that someone stands up in front of an editorial design crowd and shows them a slide that is screen grabbed from an Excel spreadsheet. I actually tried to put this into Illustrator and it looked worse. So I... <laughs> So I just stopped. <laughs> I'm an editor by trade. I, I don't understand what you all do. So, the, so, so rare for that reason. Rare for the second reason that this is a set of figures about independent magazines that I trust. So this is the stack um, subscriber numbers right from... So I don't know what I did with the first two months' worth of subscriber details. I couldn't find them anywhere on my hard drive. So we start in March 2009, um, and we're, we run right up to the, the present day. 
And what I mean, like you can kind of see that, you know, back so down here, I'm running stack one day a week and doing stuff, and then I start running stack two days a week, and then at this flat period here, um, I started running stack three days a week, but I was also editorial director at a creative creative agency uh, for two days a week. And editorial director at a creative agency is not a two-day week job, and <laughs> running Stack at that point was not a three-day week job, and so we just had this like infuriating, just flat line for like a year and a bit, um, and then that's when I basically um, went for it, um, and it's doing that. And so the the thing that this shows is kind of like, well, first of all, it showed me brilliant. That was the right decision to go full time, go for it, excellent. But also, this is—I think this this basically shows Stack riding that wave that I talked about earlier. This is the the wave of independent magazines. The the interest is just growing and growing and growing. And I think that when you can show something like this in the face of like you know everyone talking about the decline of print and all the rest of it, when you can say to somebody, Stack increased 80% year on year last year, that sort of stops them in their tracks and makes them think, okay. Maybe there's something in this, and this is at the heart of my whole point about new media. Now, this is, um, as I'm sure lots of you will recognise, this is "Do You Read Me in Berlin," a shop I've never been to, but I've really looked at the pictures. The, it looks fantastic. Um, I use this this picture to illustrate um, a, a point that Jeremy made. Um, In his、uh, Modern Magazines book that he, he published last year, which I'm sure you've all read because you're here. If you haven't already, read Modern Magazine. It's the Modern Magazine, right? The Modern Magazine.、Um, and in, in his introduction, Jeremy talks about this being a second golden age for、uh, for magazine publishing. And so, if the first golden age came about in kind of the 50s, 60s, and it was driven by the Mad Men, basically, it was you know kind of. These guys had invented this thing called advertising, and they needed somewhere to put their adverts. And so, a whole wave of fantastic, now classic magazines grew up to be the place where those, those adverts could go. This second golden,、uh, this second golden age、um, uh, of magazine publishing is driven by technology. So, these days, somebody working in their bedroom with a subscription to Creative Cloud is using the same stuff to make a magazine that the guys at Condé Nast are using. These days, someone who has an idea for a magazine can go to Kickstarter and get the funding and the groundswell of support for it, and that's something that just did not exist five years ago. You couldn't do that; it didn't exist. All these things have, I think, helped have contributed towards this kind of this real.、Um, Incredible sort of creative blooming in the independent magazine market, and it's fantastic. I mean, you just see this; it's like, you know, floor to ceiling, wall to wall, beautiful independent magazines, stuff that people have poured heart and soul into. Excellent, brilliant. The bad news is exactly the same. Every single one of these magazines is in competition with every single other magazine. It's become easier than ever to make an independent magazine, and so then it follows that it becomes harder than ever to actually find your your readership. And, and of course, you're not just competing with every other magazine; you're competing with every YouTube channel, and just just I mean, there's so much content in the world now. It's, it's ballooned. It's gone. It's gone mad. And so to actually sort of like stake your claim to someone's time has become harder than ever. Also. These magazines have all had to actually physically get to this place, and this is a distribution point I mentioned earlier. So, you know, you've got these people working in this amazingly exciting 21st century way. You know, kind of they might be working in different countries from each other. Editors in like sort of the U.S., the designers over here, like they're using Dropbox, they're putting something together, they're using this like cloud-based design software. It's amazing. That didn't exist a couple of years ago. They even go to a printer, and the printer's technologies have like changed amazingly. So, the, so now you can print way smaller runs, and you used to be able to do all this stuff. Technology's thrust it forward, and then you're left with several boxes of magazines that you have to somehow get out to people. So, whereas kind of you know, all media's been disrupted, but for example, YouTube and Vimeo have come along and given people making film and TV another distribution net,、uh, network. The same hasn't happened for magazines. You still have these physical things that you have to move around the place. So that, for me, is the that's kind of the bad news side of this. But of course, that's not really the bad news because the really bad news is that <laughs> most magazine shops don't look like that. <laughs> They look like that.、Um, 
I mean, we all know this. I, actually, and I, I should say, I'm speaking from a, a British point of view. I understand that it's slightly different here um, in Germany. Um, but still, I mean, you know, kind of the position there goes to the highest bidder. It doesn't go to the most exciting, most creative magazine. Um, I also, I always feel really bad for, like, for these ones here, um, which I think is like, I think it might be Red or Easy Living. Um, and you can just imagine that like, somewhere there's a team who've sat down and gone, come on, guys, we can do this. We're going to make this issue the best yet. We're, this is going to be the one that Cover Junkie puts on the side. This is going to be amazing. We're going to get it out there. And someone puts a strip of wet wipes in front of it, and it may as well not be there. So the, this is kind of... This is what magazine publishers are battling against. And for the independents, it just doesn't work. You may well... I mean, you know, in fact, I know that on there, there's like Little White Lies, Huck is on there. They may as well not be there, because when they're not given the space and the kind of respect that they need, they just blend in and they look like everything else. And that's because, for me, when I think of independent magazines, I think of this. I think of this bunch of beautifully crafted freaks and weirdos that have like somehow made it out into the world and like the you know some big ones some little ones and some geeky ones and some cool ones there's some that you just don't know honestly what they're trying to do but they're but great brilliant excellent <laughs> 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 amazing so disney's getting the first round of applause of the day the um this is, what, this is what I think of with these magazines, and this is the way that we need to approach them. We need to recognize the amazing variety and color and difference that's in there and come up with ways of distributing them that respects that and plays to it, and I think it's possible. So just to run you through a few of the magazines, so the rest of my time is going to be on that. This is a, a magazine called Pedif. Uh, it's published in Spain. It's in Spanish and English. Uh, we sent this out on Stack uh, last summer, and it's one of the ones that consistently... Like time after time, people keep saying to me, oh my God, that was the best thing that I read last year. Um, it's a magazine all about happiness. So it's not just like the happiness issue. The entire magazine is built around happiness. And that kind of sounds a bit sappy when you say it like that. But this, for example, is um, a story about a woman in Iceland um, who believes in fairies. And this is a picture of her hugging a fairy. And, she, and this is kind of like where her happiness comes from. This is her thing. This is a, a spread um, about the kind of, you know, the tingly feeling you get when the, and there's a word for it, but I can't remember it. There's just sort of like the tingly feeling you get when there's like this immense thrill of happiness. It's a story on that. I mean, just so commercially unfeasible. Like, you, you could not... You could not take this to the, the board of a, a big publishing company and say, come on, guys, we want to make this magazine all about happiness. It's going to have, you can't really see it here, but it's going to have this amazing, like, kind of glittery foil on the, the uh, masthead on there. It's going to be open bound on the side, so it'll open out really flat like this. It's going to be a beautiful thing. Wouldn't fly. But the fact is that this new breed of publisher is coming through with the tools at their disposal to actually make that happen. And so now these magazines exist. This is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. So this is Works That Work, um, which is published in the Netherlands. Um, and it's a, a magazine of unexpected creativity. Um, so this is kind of Peter, who, uh, who publishes this magazine, speaks about it as almost an anti-design magazine. Because it's a design magazine, but it's interested in the kind of solutions that people come up with to make their day-to-day -day lives a bit better. And so, for example... You get a, it's an amazing story in the current issue uh, on the siege of Sarajevo, and this is a story that you know we're all familiar with. We know the basics of what happened. You know, the city was was under siege for five years. It's terrible, terrible stuff. But actually, then they go into the things that people salvaged and made for themselves. And so they've got pictures of the stoves that people made out of tin cans and stuff. And you've got pictures of, like, periscopes and wirelesses and all these kind of amazing pieces of, like, human ingenuity that come together. And it tells a story in a completely different way that you've never seen before. It makes you think about it in a way you've never seen before. And the thing is that Peter, uh, behind the magazine, um, doesn't just uh, write stories about this stuff, doesn't just edit stories about this stuff. The magazine actually is an example of what it is. So he um, started the magazine and really, well, knew from the outset that magazines traditionally are funded by advertising, um, 
that doesn't work when you're making a small magazine. So everything for him is on the cover price. He knows that a huge amount of the expense of making magazine go, magazines goes into distribution. So he set up a, a social distribution system whereby readers and fans can go and pick up copies of the magazine and take it away with them when they're going somewhere. And then that's how the magazine gets around the world. I, I saw him in Amsterdam last month, and he was meeting someone, I think, from Libya that day. To, and they were like sort of going to take a bundle of magazines off to Libya to distribute for him. He makes fantastic stuff like this. So the, the costs of making a magazine, you can see distribution, 45% cut out of the, the cost of making a magazine. So because, because he's thinking again about what it is to make a magazine, he's doing it in a completely different way to what's gone before. And I find that incredibly exciting. Brewster is a magazine from Australia. Um, and this is just like, it's one of those beautiful concepts that blew my mind when I saw it. So this is a travel magazine, but it doesn't just travel in space, it travels in time. So the, the guys who um, set it up um, work for like a mainstream publisher in Australia um, and they were doing a story on this trail in New Zealand. So the first issue was set in New Zealand um, and it was like the centenary of the, the trail and so they were going back and finding archive imagery. Um, and they found these old um, stereoscopic images and the, and the stereoscope was the, the, the world's first portable 3D viewing device. That's cool. I'm totally fine with five minutes. No problem. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, Stereoscope was the world's first portable 3D viewing device. It's kind of like a pair of binoculars. And so you take these dual images, kind of a little bit uh, uh, set apart from each other, put them in the stereoscope, and it creates a 3D image. And he realized that if you took those, uh, those separate images, uh, ran them through Photoshop, isolated the red and the blue channels, he could make modern 3D uh, images, which when you wear a pair of 3D glasses, kind of like comes to life. And so then they paired that with a piece of um, writing about the Milford Trail, this place in New Zealand, which was written at the same time uh, as the photographs were taken. And so what you get is this incredible like journey back to New Zealand at the like sort of beginning of the 19th century uh, no sorry 20th century end of the 19th century um, and it's, it's just magic it's brilliant the thing that's really interesting for me about this is that they made 500 copies this is something that you know it's it's zine like it's it, it's a zine except with this kind of like level of of kind of of like technical uh, I can't think of the word. Basically, you couldn't make this as a zine. You need to be able to print this properly to get the, the registration right, to get the, the images actually right and working. And so then you end up with you know, a, a really, really small run magazine. And they're now on, the, yeah, on their third issue, so they went to Japan for their second issue. Third issue's coming soon. I think it's fantastic. I love the fact that there are people out there who are doing this stuff. And finally, uh, Benji Newman. So this is a, a magazine made in Latvia uh, by a, a pair of women who have created this, in, this whole like, fictional character of Benji Newman. And Benji Newman is this guy who comes from an English-speaking country, um, recently found out that he has Latvian heritage, and so travelled back. He's in his mid-30s. And, the, and like, kind of when you email him and stuff, they're like, yeah, Benji's away at the moment, but we can answer um, on his behalf. And they, had, they have this whole, like, sort of... And the, they use the magazine to... You can see, sorry, that's just to show in English and Latvian. Um, and so they use the magazine to kind of explore their fascinations, their obsessions. And the, the theme that runs through it all is this incredibly personal take on the world. So this is uh, uh, spread from a shoot that they did in Stevie G, the illustrator Stevie G and his wife's house in London. And then, so that's their cat. They've got pictures of their kids in there. And it's this incredibly open. I mean, like, you know, I personally wouldn't let someone into my house to photograph my kid and stuff. It's the, but they, they sort of like, they've taken this incredibly personal approach with it. And then right in the middle of it, oh, you get this super sexy photo shoot, which is, you know, for them, it's, well, it's all about, um, you know, kind of this woman um, being happy with the person she is. It's like, well, this is ranging so far around the place, and yet it all hangs together. It coheres around this idea of the very personal approach. And this, this happened because... It, this happens as a direct result of the, the editor and the art director worked at Latvia's biggest like, commercial publisher. 
And they said that they were just sick of feeling the fear of doing the wrong thing all the time. They, like, they, kind of, they, they were working in this job and were constantly scared that they were like, getting something a bit wrong. And so this is the magazine where they can get nothing wrong because they're completely following their own impulses. And again, that makes for... you know, When, when you get a magazine that's been made by someone just because it has to be in the world, they have to make it it makes for such a thrilling and, and exciting read. I, I, that's essentially why I love this stuff. So, in summary, I think that for the future distribution, we need something which respects all of those weird freaks and monsters and oddities. We need something that's fair. It's just not right that you know, the, the, some of the biggest distributors at the moment are just taking eye-watering amounts of money. It doesn't need to be done like that. We need something that's flexible. It needs to be able to morph and stretch according to the magazine that's been used. It needs to be opinionated. It's no good to just say, like, you know, well, you know, it's, it's 20 boxes. That's all I care about. The, we need distribution that understands these magazines and is passionate about it. It needs to be easy. It needs to be easy for the publishers to use. It needs to be easy for customers, for people to buy magazines. It needs to be digital first. I love the independent magazine shops. We need more of them. That's excellent. But that's not enough on its own. People these days buy stuff online. When you teach, well, I mean, I, I sell uh, single issues on the stack site, and it trickles. There's like, you know, kind of maybe one or two a week. People buy stuff online. We need to figure out a way of actually making magazines uh, a more enticing thing to buy online. It needs to be experimental. It has to be. It has to be trying something new. It needs to be international. The, you know, kind of, again, people expect these days, if they're buying something online, in particularly, they should be in America, they should be able to buy it in the UK. It's fine. This is, these borders don't have to exist in that way. And it needs to be profitable. It needs to work. And as you can probably tell, I've been working on something like this, and I was really hoping to be able to unveil it for today, and it's not ready. <laughs> so I can't. But um, stay tuned. Uh, I've got a new thing coming. Um, this is me on um, Twitter and Instagram. Um, please follow me. Uh, and the QVED15 is a code which gives you 10% off uh, stack subscription. So if you think that looks like a good thing, um, please go for it. That's it. <laughs>